introduction. Uh, this is uh, that, that means a lot to me to hear that. Um, I feel like I was stuck off in the in, in the hinterlands of Alabama, talking about evolutionary mismatch and all this stuff, and uh, everybody looked at me like I was from Mars. And I just it, so going to that that meeting with you guys was when I finally felt like I'd, I'd found my group. So uh, yeah, this uh, talk is going is entitled "Evolutionary Mismatch as a Meta Theory for Chronic Disease States." Um, this is what uh, sort of the outline of the, the talk is going to be, like just answer like what, what is evolutionary mismatch in general, like, like just as a very generic sort of understanding of what it is. And then I'll talk about how mismatch fits into the uh, larger framework of what has been called Darwinian medicine or evolutionary medicine. Um, and this, this, will, this will include sort of a digression on some of the other like mid-level theories of uh, disease and dis dysfunction. And then uh, I'll talk about uh, what might be called Tim, Tim Bergen's legacy, Nico Tim Bergen's legacy in ancestral health, uh, per particularly when it comes to something called supernormal stimuli and uh, evolutionary traps. And then I'll talk, talk about something that uh, I've come up with, this term mismatched blindness, for lack of a better term. Perhaps there's another word for it out there, but I, I can't find it. Um, we'll talk about mismatched blindness. And then we'll talk about like uh, overcoming this mismatch blindness to recognize and mitigate uh, the effects of mismatch. And then like, using this paradigm or this framework to extend human performance in, in other novel environments. And then finally, uh, I'll summarize by uh, arguing that like mismatch uh, can, can be thought of as a kind of meta theory for, for current age-related disease. And I'll give some parallels with, the, with how, how the development of the germ theory might give us clues about how we, we might uh, uh, be as successful at treating chronic, chronic diseases the same way that uh, the germ theory helped us like e essentially crush inf infectious d diseases. So some of you may, uh, may have seen this from, from, from The Onion a, a couple of years ago. I, I, I spread it on, on my Facebook page every, every year or two just because it's funny. Uh, the, the title there is, uh, you know, the idiot, idiot zoo animal with zero predators still protective of her young. And then uh, it says, you know, dim, dim uh, dimwittingly refusing to let her offspring venture more than a, a few feet away from her. An idiot gazelle at the San Diego Zoo was reportedly still protective of her young Tuesday, despite facing absolutely no, pro no predators. The, the closest actual threat is thousands of miles away, but this dummy honestly thinks that she has to guard her, her babies. What a stupid moron, right? Kind of a, a comical ex example there, you know. So, um, what is an ev evolutionary mismatch? Well, very, very simply, and most of you, this is all kind of, uh, you know, well established here among you guys, but for the, for the listening audience, some of this may be new. Um, an evolutionary mismatch occurs when an adaptation or set of adaptations having evolved in response to statistically recurrent, to a statistically recurrent problem in the ancestral environment fails to operate pro properly in the modern environment or the contemporary environment. Or it can also be thought of as like when an adaptive mechanism misfires in, in the current environment due to evolutionarily novel uh, cues or environmental cues. Sometimes it, it goes by the term uh, uh, time lag or a time lag effect or a dis discordance theory. So these are all kind of uh, different re but related ways of thinking about it. I first encountered uh, the, the con th this concept in a very, very... Uh, clear way, uh, reading Richard Dawkins' uh, book, probably my favorite Richard Dawkins' book, it's called The Extended Phenotype. I read it when I was like 20 years old, and uh, there was a chapter there called, called Con Constraints Upon Perfection, and uh, Dawkins wrote that organisms are perpetually out of date. The present traits of ex extant organisms are generally forged when environmental conditions were, were different, okay? And the, the sort of the par paradigmatic example might be thought of as like a, a moth circling around an, an artificial light. Uh, we've, we've all seen this. We, we, we see this every day inside, inside cities or, or near, near street lamps, right? Moths evolved to uh, navigate using, using uh, uh, light ref reflected from the, from the moon, which is at optical infinity. So it, it, a, a moth can fly in a straight line with respect to the moon and and the, the the moon appears to uh, stay at stay at at a fixed location. But uh, boom, a, a mere hundred years or years ago, when an incandescent lighting uh, appeared in, in the environment, you know, now the moss uh, navigational systems get confused, and so they 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 they, they swim, they uh, fly around in this this 
perfect like par- parabolic uh, spiral, and they get they get trapped in, into in, in these environments. Later, uh, around the early, early 1990s, uh, this uh, a young medical doctor named Randolph Nessie uh, teamed up with a with a, a brilliant uh, evolutionary biologist named named George C. Williams, and they published a paper. Uh, called in, in a quarterly review of biology called the Dawn of Darwinian Medicine. No, I think that was 1991. Um, later, later followed up by a a, a general general non nonfiction book called Why We Get Sick. This this should be like like in, if we ever offer a course in ancestral health, like an academic course, this should be like the first thing you read is Why, why We Get Sick. Maybe even that or, original paper too, or both. So, they said they 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 ask in that paper like, okay, if evolution is powerful enough to sculpt complex uh, functioning adaptive systems that we call organisms. You know, they're, they're more statistically improbable and complex than any human invented machine. How, how is it then that, that it's not perfect, uh, that there are, we still suffer from disease and, and dysfunction? And after a number of years, they, they, they realized that, um, that there are six broad categories for why why evolution, again, as powerful as it is, nonetheless uh, left the body, our, our bodies vulnerable to to this dysfunction. And I'm just going to kind of run through run through the, these six uh, quickly, and we'll, we'll t- talk more about uh, m- mismatch, as you can probably guess later. Um, but there, there, one would be like a host parasite coevolutionary arms race. Pathogens can crank through many more generations. Uh, uh, during the lifespan of one in, in individual, like they can reproduce, bacteria can re- reproduce within like like minutes, right? So they have a lot more time to uh, actually evolve ways of outwitting our our defense mechanisms. So we're we're always in this uh, what's been called the red red queen race, uh, this arms race with these these pathogens. Uh, another example would, would be like trade offs. You know, example uh, there was selection pressure to, in Homo sapiens to have a large brain, uh, starting starting in you. Know, Utero and fetal development, but that 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 was constrained by our, our there, there was a trade-off because the brain couldn't get too big because it, it would it would pose uh, danger dangers during during childbirth because the mother's uh, pelvis can only get so so big right so there it, so trade-offs are involved. Uh, there also were what has been what they call design constraints or historical legacies like the the windpipe uh, opens up into our throat throat because of how the the you know phylogenetic hist- history is uh, of, 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 of tetrapods like us well this this leads to this can lead to a choking hazard now and now so you know but there's not much we can we can do about that really uh, you know it's, it's, it's interesting to, to know that and also surprisingly uh, the goal of evolution is not to produce health per se but it's actually to produce health as long as it's tributary to re- reproductive uh, success so uh, example where where that that may cause cause medical problems we might be like like dangerous risk risk taking among the, among the among the young especially uh, uh, in males right you know driving fast uh, doing all kinds of I mean the, we could give whole lectures about we could have a whole symposia about male male stupidity when it comes to t- t- taking risk uh, or just young young people in general and also importantly defenses. Uh, there are di- things that are not diseases or dysfunctions, but they're ac- they actually make patients feel bad. Uh, they c- these things are, are actually defenses against other diseases or, or, or pathogens. And they would include things like coughing, sneezing, fever, depression, anxiety, anger, sadness, mo- morning sickness. Uh, someone asked Dr. Emily Deans this morning about, about like, well, is there a time when we, c- we should maybe not treat depression? And she was like, yeah, there are times when depression is actually appropriate, right? So we, that's, a, that's an area where ancestral health, we might uh, in the future think of ways in which mismatch, which is this, this last, last category, uh, like inter- intersects with, uh, you know, defenses. We, we, not, we want mismatch to be a broad meta theory, but we don't want to over apply it, okay? And we, we might all, all think, think about ways that mismatch could be a, uh, tilting the playing field uh, uh, away or toward uh, like drug drug resi- resistant bacteria like, and, and people are already starting to talk about this and like the mi- microbiome well so of those six reasons you know uh, gosh uh, uh, our understanding that germs exist actually and they sometimes cause cause pathology is one of the greatest triumphs in all of all of scientific history like we were able to invent vaccines and anti- antibiotics and drive, drive certain things like smallpox to extinction you know 
these great scourges of, of human, humankind have been, have been uh, successfully more or less conquered by, by this, 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 this part of medicine. And now, like, failure to understand the evolutionary process, though, has led to the fact that now we're facing, like, drug-resistant pathogens. So, you know, this is, this is going to be like the germ theory 2.0, applying evolutionary medicine to, to, to that. But as, as most of you may, may know, um, yeah, so the other big area uh, is, of course, mismatch, right? And this is, this, uh, okay, this is probably related to almost, the, almost certainly the majority of the, uh, of the chronic illnesses that we face. Um, and so, you know, it's like currently like 50% of, of the global population now has, probably has one or more chronic des diseases, and that, that may be a, an underestimate. Right, so I think we could we could we, we might be on a a, a real a, a conceptual breakthrough here that could do something like uh, for chronic disease what the germ theory did for infectious disease. So um, going on to Nico Nico Tim Bergen's legacy and and ancestral health, uh, he he uh, out, argued that like a complete biological exp explanation of any phenomenon. Uh, requires uh, an understanding that there are both uh, proximate mechanisms giving rise to a to a biological phenomenon as well as ultimate ex explanations and he broke those into uh, two different types or subcategories of proximate and two subcategories of ult ultimate basically uh, the current like medical paradigm is mainly focused on on the various proximate mechanisms you know uh, hyperinsulinemia is leading to down regulation of the insulin receptors or this or that uh, signaling pathway is not working right. How can we invent drugs to this going to do this thing at, at, at the approximate level? So ancestral health and uh, evolutionary medicine as, as a whole is trying to say, okay, well, let's let's try to round out these approximate explanations with with the, the ultimate ones. Um, so, but T Tim Bergen is, is is less maybe a little bit less less well well known for the for the for the concept of a supernormal stimulus or supernormal stimuli. That can occur when the frequency, duration, or intensity of an environmental cue is increased in a novel environment, such that the behavior it elicits is stronger than would have been seen in the ancestral environment, or that's sometimes called the EEA, the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, right? The ancestral environment. So, organisms generally don't 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 have ways to fil filter out these strong signals, and, and may and may respond inappropriately in an environment that, that contains. Super, super, super normal stimulus or stimuli. Uh, you know, we all talk, talk about the uh, presence of hyper palatable foods in, in the modern environment. That's, that, those, I think it's reasonable to say that those are probably, uh, they, they flooded the, the market because they, they, they tap into our, our, our evolved preferences. And so now, now they're ramped up into like, like super normal levels. Pornography, drug addiction, et, et cetera. Um, also, interestingly, uh, the, uh, Tim Bergen described what he, he called physiological traps, and people have talked about these in the literature. They've, they've talked about sensory traps or, or ecological traps, um, uh, overposition traps, but they, the more general term is evolutionary trap. And um, this, is, uh, this can occur when in an environment that has been altered suddenly by human activities, uh, in which case an organism makes maladaptive behavioral or life history choice Choices based on formerly reliable environmental cues, despite the av availability of higher, higher quality options. Right. So, uh, an another good good example. Some of you may be may be familiar with this. You know, sea, sea turtle hatchlings evolved. You know, to mostly uh, uh, hatch out of their of their nest uh, at, at at nighttime, right? And they they like 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 the moths. You know, would have would have relied on cues from the moon, because if you imagine being a baby. Uh, sea, sea turtle, and you, you hatch out, and you just open your eyes for the first time. Where's the, the only source of light for millions of years? Would it would have been uh, blue light reflecting off the off the ocean surface? That's that's your first mission is to get off the beach because you can get eaten or gobbled up if, if you hang out on the beach too long. So it's like critical to its its, its survival. It gets off the beach as soon as soon as possible. And we've all seen cute cute cute, cute videos of you know of a turtle scrambling toward the. Uh, Water. Well, of course, you know, boom. A thousand, I mean, a hundred years ago, artificial lights get put on put on the beach. So now, now it, it screws up their navigational systems. Some other delightful examples. I, I want to thank thank George George Diggs for uh, bringing some of these to my attention. Uh, 
uh, on the upper uh, upper left there, there's a, uh, you know a, a frog that has apparently mistaken uh, you know an artificial light for for a bioluminescent prey item. On the upper right there is a, is a shore, shore bird that has, has, has gobbled up a bunch of plastic. There's a lot of attention now toward plastic in the environment, and especially the marine and aquatic environments. Um, all kinds of organisms are just gobbling up these these plastic bits. You know, they they don't they, they never they're blind right to the the fact that a little squiggly, smushy looking uh, blue blue thing is actually not a, a food food item, but it's a piece of plastic, right? And the most delightful of all mismatch ex examples, and again, credit goes to George Diggs for bringing this to my attention, uh, is the on, on the lower left there, the the male male jewel beetle just happened to happen to be attracted to uh, the, 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 those are beer bottles that were manufactured in the 1980s in Australia. And evidently to a male bl uh, jewel beetle, that's, that's pretty hot, hot stuff there. That the, the, the female uh, has, has a, you know, has like a golden uh, uh, carapace, you know, golden dimpled paracase uh, or carapace. So that's like uh, super hot to her. And as, as Dr. Diggs pointed out, the, uh, evidently these uh, jewel beetles were congregating on these on these beer bottles, and would stay there until um, they died of de dehydration, or ants would come up and and bite their ding dongs off. <laughs> Is that that's true? Isn't it? <laughs> it's not my fault. Uh, and, and and also, but uh, thankfully, thankfully, actually, the, the there was public awareness about this, and the, and the beer bottle, uh, the beer, beer manufacturers uh, changed changed their their design, right? So that that's nice. Uh, and the last last example, a lot of uh, uh, aquatic insects like uh, are attracted to the to the polarized light that, that comes off of. Well, they're naturally supposed to be able to zoom in on on aquatic uh, environments where they can lay lay their eggs, but. Uh, s solar panels and, and some windows and, and glass surfaces uh, uh, change light such, such, such that polarized light is emitted and then so they're they're mistaking these these solar panels and these uh, glass surf surfaces and lighting on there uh, attempting to uh, uh, oviposit on these surfaces so an example that I talked about last uh, fall to my to my students up in up in Binghamton, New York. Uh, a, one of my favorite examples, actually, from a 2000 pa 2017 paper just last year from from my, from my grief and, and colleagues. Uh, acoustic mirrors uh, as sensory traps for bats. They used the they they did an experiment with these uh, with with myotis myotis the uh, greater mouse eared bat, and they set up this contraption this. Uh, Experimental chamber where they uh, put placed um, a a really flat, smooth metal uh, plate both on the floor of the enclosure and also on the uh, wall of the of the enclosure. Okay, and then they they like released these bats in, into this chamber and then they filmed filmed their their their, their behavior in this uh, environment, right? With these high-speed cameras, it's good to keep keep in mind that in in the natural world there would have been uh, nothing this smooth, right? So that if you're a bat flying flying around, almost everything would would have have, have re re reflected sound waves because it, even a pretty uh, smooth sheer rock face would still have little little uh, dimples and things that would would reflect back enough uh, light to these to these uh, these bats that use echolocation to nav navigate through their, their environment, right? Well, when in the presence of this evolutionary novelty, right, and a very smooth surface, you know, if the bat is flying, in, if, if, if you see on, on number two there, you know, right, the bat, if the bat is flying directly into the smooth surf surface, the sound waves bounce back and it can avoid the, the uh, glass or the metal surface, you know, uh, quite quite well, but when the when the angle is more obtuse there, like uh, as in scenario, scenario one, the light waves, uh, or excuse me, the sound sound waves reflect off an in insufficient uh, amount uh, or intensity of the waves reflect back. So, let's see what actually happens. If I can get get the video to work, um, the first video is going to show you what happens when they when they put the the smooth sur surface. Along the floor. Here we go. Can you see that? Yeah. The bats are flying in, and they're actually uh, evidently attempting to drink. 
from the surface there, okay? The next thing is going to show you, yeah, what they call near, near collisions. If you look on the left there, it shows you sort of the, the, the side view, and the, the bat flies in, and it just it almost hits the... Now, here's, here it is where there's a, a collision with, with a maneuver. So the, the bat takes evasive action at just the last moment. It's, it's flying in at a more obtuse angle. And finally, and this is everybody's favorite, collision without maneuver. Ouch. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. So that's, that's, that's pretty awesome, huh? Right? So I, I, I like that example because it shows, it, it shows you the actual proximate mechanisms involved. Like we can talk about mismatch in a general theoretical way, but this gets into the nitty-gritty of the actual what actual proximate mechanisms involved. And you can keep doing studies and figure out exactly what is the angle and how's that, what, at what angle does it increase the probability by X amount. It's a perfect example of like the ultimate and proximate uh, levels of ex explanation. Um, so, of course, pe pe people say, "Okay, well, you know, where these mismatches are, are occurring, what you know, what what we, we live in this this modern environment, there's, there's there's nothing we can do about it, right? Who cares, you know? Well, th th this is kind of a moot point because um, uh, as, as anthropogenic changes brought about by the ag agricultural rev revolution. However, with some caveat uh, by the, from what Dr. Rose talk, talked about ye yesterday re regarding what I'm calling the Rose Rutledge effect, um, but it, especially after the Industrial Revol Revolution, these changes were very sudden and comprehensive and, and numerous, right? And, and, and besides, the, the, the goal of medicine is, is to reduce suffering in, the, uh, in, in currently ex existing individuals, all right? Why, we, we don't want to just wait, wait around for evolution to, to help organisms uh, like adapt to this to this new environment because species may go ex ex extinct or whatever in that meantime or they're they're going to uh, have have reduced func func functionality so right plus as 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 the smartest organisms on the planet I mean we shouldn't just run around and be oblivious to these mi mismatch effects right especially when when they're causing damage to our ourselves or other species this this photograph by the way um, I'm sorry I'm I'm looking at the wrong wrong slide here. Um, because of this next slide, next slide here. That's you've been looking at that one, right? Excuse me, I, I apologize about that. So yeah, so so uh, at some point, of course, you know, mismatch occurs. Because, you know, uh, it, it just mismatch mismatches have always been occurring for millions of years. It's it's, it's synonymous with like evolutionary selection pressure. And as the uh, critic of the ancestral health movement, Marlena Zook, pointed out in her, in her book, you know, uh, Paleo Fantasies. Right, organisms are, are, are constantly out, out of date, right? They're 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 always facing some some degree of change in the environment, right? Temperatures are always changing, or or there are always faster predators that have been co-evolving with us, or more dangerous parasites. So you know, why why even bother? It's not like you know, like, like evolutionary selection just stops, right? But this this gets on onto the next next slide. I I just I just explained this is kind of a moot point, right? We wanna we wanna fix these problems. Uh, ad address them. We don't want to wait wait around for an for another 300 gener generations before hopefully we can get uh, the reduce this mismatch. These photographs, by the by the way, are, are uh, those taken by my grandfather who went on a uh, photo safari in Kenya in 1969. Um, that's of the uh, the uh, the acacia acacia environment there, the savanna. I, th I thought those were those were beautiful. I thought I would include those. Um, so mismatch blindness, you know, a, a, a peculiar feature of, of, of mismatch is like, like, is that we, we, we organisms are, are kind of blind to these evolutionarily novel dangers, right? And where, whereas we have, we have evolved defenses or, or alert systems to evolutionarily familiar dangers, such as dehydration, starvation, predators, disgust mechanisms, We've, we have evolved disgust mechanisms against like disease-laden food. We had that way before we had the germ theory, right? We have these like alert systems that can tell us, you know, hey, you might want to avoid that or go more toward this. Um, we we have emotions like guilt, shame, jealousy to alert us to to behaviors that might be threat threatening our social or sexual interest, right? 
But importantly, we lack, and we can be expected to lack, adaptations that alert us to, to dangers of processed food, ex ex excessive bright light, um, uh, at nighttime, lack of e exercise, etc. So the ancestral health strategy is all about recognizing these novel threats and trying to design like a lifestyle uh, uh, around these, right? So this is where I think uh, going forward, we need to try to like develop mismatch theory so that we can like anticipate mismatch effects before they occur. An example, and we've, we've, we've had success at this. If you think about it, like uh, when, when long, long duration um, transoceanic uh, sailing voyages were take, taking place, one of the things that started happening is people were getting, uh, the sailors were getting scurvy, right? And I read the other, the other day in preparation for this that it, it, it's in some uh, cases in British uh, military or naval history, uh, scurvy and, and other d diseases were causing more deaths than, than, than combat, okay? And then sort of like there was sort of a haphazard, dis uh, haphazardly they discovered that, you know, citrus fruit could, could prevent scurvy. We, we now know that's because they, they were suffering from vitamin, acute vitamin D, de defi uh, excuse me, vitamin C deficiencies. Well, you know, they did that without an explicit understanding of mismatch theory. So going forward, looking at, at, at the, uh, the things that humans are doing now, um, like scuba, if you think about it, scuba equipment, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, are, they could be thought of as kind of a bundle of biohacks, right? It is, there's like a little self-contained little uh, series of gadgets that are, are, you know, try to recreate some basic uh, evolutionarily familiar things like, like oxygen and, and, and such, right? Um, those of you who know anything about flying, uh, uh, we, we, we big apes have not been uh, uh, flying around in heavier than air uh, flying contraptions very, very long, less than, uh, barely, barely over 100 years, right? Well, the, the instrument panel, you know, we have to have an instrument, a series of instruments that alert us to, you know, how the position of the plane and all that. Well, why is the, there, there's this thing called the, called the artificial or horizon or the uh, attitude I indicator. Why is that the, the attitude indicator not just a series of dials, black and white numbers and, and, and uh, dials like, like, like the other instrument? I was talking to Tess this morning. She's been learning how to, how to fly. You know, well, the uh, artificial horizon tells you, is the plane flying toward the ground or not? Why does it, why does it have sim simulate the brown of, of the ground and the blue of the sky? Because it taps into our evolved ability to recognize horizon from sky, right? It's more evolutionarily familiar to us than looking at a, a simple gauge like that. So, you know, uh, if we're going to really, really extend human, human performance in, uh, in quite mismatchy environments, like, like, like the, the colonization of Mars and long duration space, space flight. Uh, you know, in, institutes like the uh, Institute for Human and Machine Cognition down in Pensacola, they're, they're actually uh, using research like looking at uh, the effects of dietary ketosis to help make humans more, more resilient in these environments. I think this is just sort of the, the beginning of what's gonna, uh, em gonna grow uh, or what we hope will grow into a, to a whole full-fledged um, like scientific par paradigm that will really help uh, humans extend. And we have the youngest biohacker here. This is Isaac Fowler, Tess, and uh, Ryan's, Ryan's uh, son here. Uh, he's, he's, he's our newest biohacker here. So if, if he's going to go to Mars, maybe we can, we, this will be developed by the time he gets old enough. So one of the final points, uh, the ancestral health or applied mismatch theory approach can, could potentially be as profound as the, as the germ theory. Uh, as sort of a, a conceptual advance, right? And how so? The 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 germ theory was as much a conceptual and theoretical ad breakthrough as it was any particular set of uh, experimental observations. And this is sort of the logic that I, I see. Okay, the the germ theory worked because it established that a germs exist. The germs actually exist. They're they're actually real. And it took scientific argument decades. For, to actually establish that that uh, claim, right? And then also germs sometimes cause disease. That need, needed to be established. And then Im importantly, uh, the early pioneers in the germ theory argued that we can take measures ag against these. Similarly, I think we can follow so sort of a similar, similar uh, approach uh, in ancestral health, this part of Darwinian medicine, and arguing that, okay, mismatch effects are very real. 
mismatch effects sometimes cause disease and dysfunction. And importantly, crucially, we can take measures against them. Okay? So that's kind of an overview of the way I see it. And I would like to uh, ag acknowledge both the, the, uh, the society, Ancestral Health Society, and also my uh, uh, graduate institution, the uh, State University of New York in Binghamton. Importantly, my, my, my PhD advisor, uh, David Sloan Wilson, who he was a former speaker at AHS, and I hope, hope to get him back in future years. Uh, also, per, Professor Michael Rose, who was in the audience, and his, his grad student, Grant Rutledge, who spoke here two years ago. And then uh, my friend Richard Richards, who finally got me to actually go, go paleo. He's a professor at the University of Alabama. I'm, I'm forever indebted to him. And then Ken, Ken Ford at the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. And then uh, Aaron Blaisdell, George Diggs, Tess Fowler, and all of you people, uh, too many to, to mention, okay? And then my, my graduate colleagues and students that were in my mismatch study group this past spring. We, we had a little study group up, up in Binghamton, and uh, we really, I think, uh, the, the, the young, younger minds really grasp these ideas. They don't, they don't come to this with, like, all these pre preconceived understandings of, of disease, and it makes incredible sense to them, and I hope to get, get some of them to join us at, at future, future conferences. So I think I'm just about finishing on time, so we don't have any questions. We have a question over here. Brett, um, the light bulb came on for me as you were talking that uh, the concept of mismatch is kind of in that continuum with uh, evolution. Uh, we have a uh, environmental stressor that changes whatever species it is slightly. And in there, there's going to be times when the mismatch is so bad, um, some in that species will die off. I guess we always kind of knew that, that we would evolve to something else under the environmental pressures. And so, one, a lot of people don't like the concept of um, evolution, just partly because they've been to told that the world is only like 10,000 years old, and um, that Darwin, Darwinian evolution is incorrect. So, but what can we do today, and where are we kind of on that continuum f for the human species evolving, and uh, what are some of the deleterious things that are going on with mismatch today? Okay, yeah, good, good, good question. Uh, I think the thing, the important, most important thing is we can't, we simply can't. I mean, do we want to wait around for you know another eighty or hundred generations to start make us to m make us better adapted to ju junk food, or, or do we want to try to wait, you know, uh, and maybe step back and try to fix the mismatches at more more the root cause? You know, because I, I mean, the goal of medicine is to address human suffering now within one gen generation. Uh, we want to be, be 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 better, uh, more healthy now. So, yeah, um, th yeah. The, the, but your your more general question. I mean, I I come from the American South, you know, and there's there's great hostility toward evolution there. Uh, the thing I've been trying to argue and and build build uh, bridges with 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 Christians, including my whole friends, family social network back home is, like, you know, failure to understand evolution is causing concrete suffering. It's like, if this was 120 years ago, like, darn it, failure to understand that germs really exist, it, this is causing suffering. This, this even. So, do we want to, you know, God would have presumably given us, you know, these big brains so we can, like, use them and employ them to to reduce human human suffering. I mean, what, you know, uh, could, there, could there be a greater endeavor for us humans, you know, to try to, try to understand what, what's, what's causing needless suffering in, in the universe. So, of course, the, the, there will definitely be a lot of suffering in the, in the animals that we're going to have, have to kill to eat them, but, but a lot of that is just part of, the, part of the, the, the background suffering, and so it's not my fault. It's not yours either, so. Thank you, wonderful talk. Um, you might, might be aware that uh, microbiology is currently exploding with research showing correlations between every form of chronic disease and dysbiosis, intestinal dysbiosis. Um, and obviously, the overuse of antibiotics, uh, the overuse of 
uh, cleaning of surfaces and washing of hands with triclosan and all these sort of things. Yes, so I'm just really curious about your parallel of uh, the way we need to use uh, this meta theory in the same way that germ theory uh, created this understanding of, of parasites and microbes and how do we protect ourselves from those sort of mistakes? I, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I, I, th I think we're doing it here, right? Do you have any thoughts? Or? Well, um, the thing is, <laughs> when you look at the history of medicine in, in relation to the 19th century development of germ theory, there were people who understood what was happening in the way we understand it uh -huh. now, intuitively. So what I'm thinking is, uh, in our own time, we actually need diversity of thought, and we need, um, we need respect for non-scientific intuitive understandings because they might actually um, turn out to be things that can be mes mechanistically proven. Yeah. I, I hope so. <laughs> Any other questions? Come on, Dr. Rose, I know you have one. <laughs> Who cuts your hair? <laughs> I, I learned how to cut my own hair because Dan Party cuts his own hair, and I want—I want to be a cool guy with a nice coiffure like Dan Party. So, <laughs> okay. No more questions. All right. room and then come back in here at 410.